Let us pray. Ever-living God, whose will it is that all should come to you through your Son, Jesus Christ, 
inspire our witness to him, that all may know the power of his forgiveness and the hope of his resurrection, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. 
O oh God, the protector of all who trust in you, without whom nothing is strong, nothing is holy. Increase and multiply upon us your mercy, that with you as our ruler and guide, we may so pass through things temporal that we lose not the things eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Reading from the first book of Kings. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I should give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love and have given him a son to sit on his throne today. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, although I am only a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of the people whom you have chosen, a great people, so numerous they cannot be numbered or counted. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil. For who can govern this, your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked for this. God said to him, Because you have asked for this, and have not asked for yourself long life or riches, or for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, I now do according to your word. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been before you, and no one like you shall arise after you. The word of the Lord. We will read Psalm 119 responsibly by half verse. Your decrees are wonderful. When your word goes forth, it gives light. I open my mouth and pant. Turn to me in mercy. Steady my footsteps in your word. Rescue me from those who oppress me. Let your countenance shine upon your servant. My eyes shed streams of tears. A reading from the Epistle to the Romans. The Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, 
he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of the Lord.
Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It's the smallest of all the seeds, but when it is grown to its greatest of shrubs, it becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Then he told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until it was all leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which someone found and hid and in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls on finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. And then the kingdom of God is like a net thrown out in the sea, caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, put the good ones into baskets, threw out the bad. And so it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the evil from the righteous, throw with them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood this? And they answered, yes. And he said to them, Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of the household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We all have our favorite Bible verses and prayers we can recite from memory. Maybe you were taught, like I was as a child, to memorize the Lord's Prayer. Or maybe from coming week after week over the course of your life to church, you've come to have written on your heart the words of the Jubilate or the Vanity, which we recite every service of morning prayer. Well, this morning's passage from Romans is familiar to every priest. I expect that most priests in here and perhaps around the world, and I see Carmen nodding, could have recited it at least partially from memory. We know it well from the rite known as the burial of the dead. Romans 8 is one of the New Testament passages suggested by our prayer book for funerals and for good reason. It is a beautiful, poetic summary of the good news that death has been transformed, transformed from the final word to another part of life, transformed from the ultimate and final extinguishing of existence to simply a turning point in the larger mystery that is life. Well, there was a time in our society when death was much more simply a fact of daily life. We were exposed to it more often. Some of you may remember. Death at any age was much more common then than now. And accordingly, people were probably more accustomed to dealing with it. It was a normal thing. The dead were even laid out at home in the parlor until the burial. And the living in those days between the death and the burial not only sat with the dead, 
accompanying them. But much of daily life continued around them. The daily life and chores of cooking and cleaning and preparing for guests continued there in the presence of the dead. And finally, when the deceased was buried, the parlor became once again the living room. Well, fortunately and blessedly, today advances in public health and modern medicine have meant that it is rare for people to die so young, and people are living much fuller and healthier and longer lives than ever before. But the shadow side of this beautiful blessing is that death has become, in effect, a taboo. We do our best to avoid it. Everything from creams and injections to hide our aging to the dying being sequestered in hospitals, the dead laid out in funeral homes instead of in the family's home. Right now, I read just a month ago in the Smithsonian Magazine, there are even billionaires in Silicon Valley trying to find new technology to beat death. We shove our mortality out of sight, out of mind, and we don't even want to see the body transformed in age and in death. But as many of us, as most of us know, avoiding taboos only make them worse. Put the smallest, tiniest monster in the closet or under the bed, and it grows. And these things come back to bite us, whether we like it or not. Well, Paul, Paul was himself in a world surrounded by violent death. The Roman Empire was good for many things. We see their, their beautiful buildings standing to this day, but it was a violent culture. Blood flowed in the gory gladiators' matches in the Colosseum, and criminals were fed to wild beasts there or crucified, just like Jesus. And even emperors' lives were short. Assassination by rivals was more or less the norm. And in this violent context, Paul has a different message. Paul is fervently, urgently pointing to resurrection. He's pointing urgently to the resurrected Christ as the new model for our being. And the resurrection becomes our new hope. By becoming incarnate in the first place, God chose vulnerability and ended up pulling a fast one on death. Death thought that it had won the ultimate fight against God and goodness when God incarnate died on the cross, but Jesus was raised from the dead. And so in Christ, God set a new narrative, a new paradigm for us to live into where the dead are no longer deaths to have, no longer death's dominion. Even though this body may be mortal and die, God reigns over even the dead, and death itself is transformed. In this new norm, the resurrected body that you and I can hope for is our final ends. And so Paul says with beautiful poetry and confidence, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? I am convinced, he says, that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is powerful. This is the ultimate promise. 
And what's more, Paul says that this is for everyone. He uses the Greek word pantone, meaning all of us, all of creation. And we see this too in the book of Revelation when all creation by the end of the book is made new. Throughout Romans, Paul refers over and over to God's promise to Abraham that God's people, just you and me and all around the world, will be a blessing to all the nations. He says, He who did not withhold his own son but gave him up for all of us, all of us when we were still sinners and still are sinners, aren't we? So at this point, some Christians might be asking, well, what's the point of being Christian then? Why bother if it's all going to be okay? Well, I hope that we are Christian followers of Christ because we have seen that God is good, that God's ways are the good ways. The psalmist says this morning, your decrees are wonderful, therefore I obey them with all my heart. Steady my footsteps in your word. Let no iniquity have dominion over me. You and I and the saints before us have seen that when we set aside the lure of our egos, of greed, of violence and corrupt power, when we humbly set God's ways before us and the way of, cross, of the cross as what we should keep our eyes on, we return to God and together become instruments of God's peace. Our individual and our collective wills become entwined with God's will. And so bit by bit, we and the world are healed and resurrected just a little bit more. We're baptized into Christ's death. We are also baptized into his resurrection, not just after our physical death, but now. We participate daily in dying to ourselves, to selfish and short-sighted ways of living. And daily we rise up anew. As such, we Christians become witnesses, testaments living, even to the whole world, to this powerful assurance and truth that this is the way of life. Paul says in Christ's resurrection, we are super conquerors. That's the Greek translation, not even more than conquerors, but super conquerors. With death defeated, there's nothing to be afraid of. We can dare to stand up to bullies and to evil, and we can challenge the unhealthy or unjust norms and structures of our society. We can, with God, breathe life into those parts of our lives and our communities that are dead and dying. And this is so powerful. We see it witnessed in the lives of saints and martyrs who've come before us, people like Martin Luther King Jr., Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and even Joan of Arc. I mean, it goes back thousands of years. And we are called to participate. Because as much as this is in God's hands, we are also called to live this out in our lives, this fearlessness of resurrection. God has given us free will and choice to participate in. As much as Paul preaches this message, this beautiful and true message of universal hope, we cannot ignore the other truth too, as Tom Blair would put it, that we will also be held accountable for our decisions in our lives. It is a message of choice and of agency now, how we choose to show our love of God and our neighbors. In the great divorce, by the great wonderful book by C.S. Lewis, there are folks, we open the, the book opens to people milling about in a dull, lifeless place, that we come to learn as the chapter unfolds is, in fact, hell. A bus shows up there at regular intervals to take these gray and lifeless souls from hell to heaven. 
It's a free ride, but you can't bring your baggage. Some people choose to get on, but many people are too bound by their egos, their greed, their grudges, their personal control, and so they choose not to get on the bus. Others, they get on the bus and they bring these things with them, and as they go on this beautiful ride, they learn God can breathe life into those things too. And so we see things leaving the bus as they go. Well, it is imperative that you and I, that we choose that bus ride, that we choose life. And we can start with some very simple simple actions that nonetheless have very deep and profound effects on our daily life, we can simply start by talking about it. Talking about death with our loved ones, with the clergy, writing down what your wishes are, filling out an advanced directive and posting it to your refrigerator or mailing it to your doctor, We can begin by reading over that beautiful burial rite and thinking about what you'd like your funeral to be like, planning your funeral much as you might a wedding, what scripture you'd want read, what hymns you'd want sung. And though this may seem daunting or it may seem like it would be a tough conversation, and believe me, it might not necessarily be an easy one, No one I have ever talked to who has worked on their final wishes has ever regretted it. Many are even surprised by the feeling of lightness and relief they felt afterwards, the specter of death relieved. You and I, we may not be forced by our daily circumstances to face death every moment of every day, but we can choose to look it in the face. We can choose to look at it and faithfully live our lives in Christ in spite of it, knowing that we have a more powerful hope in God. In doing so, in Christ, we are super conquerors. Amen. Let us now stand as able and affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
Let us kneel together in prayer and open our hearts to God. Gracious God, we pray today for the church, for the men and women of faith throughout the world who strive to serve you in word and deed. We pray for Metropolitan Richmond, the Commonwealth of Virginia, and these United States. By your Holy Spirit, guide our leaders and all government agencies to serve your people with integrity. We pray for our world and for refugees everywhere. We pray for our partners in mission and outreach locally and around the world. We pray for those who are oppressed and all who struggle for freedom and justice. We pray for peace among the nations and for an end to war. We pray for our enemies and for all who would do us harm. We pray for the women and men of our armed forces who serve in places of conflict. Keep them safe and grant them courage to serve with honor. We pray for those who are poor and suffering, for those who are lost and unloved, for those in prison and for those who live without hope. We pray for our families and friends, for those who are sick, for those who are elderly, and those who have died, that all who have asked for our prayers will know your healing power.
Run to a God that you are holy and light in the Spirit. May so move every human heart, and especially the hearts of the people of this land, that barriers which divide us may come. Suspicions disappear, and hatred cease. Without divisions being healed, we may live in justice and peace. Almighty God, you have taught us to do justice love kindness and walk humbly before you make us doers of your word that throughout the world your name may be praised and your people served in the name of our lord and savior jesus christ we pray amen let us confess our sins against god and our neighbor Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Please stand as you are able. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Good morning, St. James's, and welcome to all of you. It's wonderful to be here with you today. A very special welcome to any visitors or newcomers who may be with us today. We are delighted that you are here, and we'd love to meet you after the service. Please introduce yourself. You can also fill out one of the little cards in the pew racks and put that in the offering plate as it comes by so that we can follow up with you. We are so glad you're here. A very warm thank you and welcome to our guest organist this morning, David Fisk. David, thank you so much for your, sharing your gifts with us this morning. Remember that all through the rest of the summer, through the end of August, we have our Summer Jazz Mass at 5.30 on Sunday evenings over in Valentine Hall. And um, it's a wonderful service, so do come and invite your friends. Come be with us as we have this lovely service on, on Sunday summer evenings. We have a couple of retreats coming up in the fall that I want to make sure you know about. Um, in October, we have our annual fall parish retreat at Shrinemont. It's so much fun. I hope you'll, you'll register. We have an early bird discount that you can take advantage of if you register by August 15th. And there's also a book by our retreat leader that we're inviting you to read as your summer reading. And you can purchase that book on the portico this morning. And, and then in September, September 8th through 9th, we have a Lectio Divina workshop and retreat, which is going to be a wonderful opportunity. There's more information in the chimes, and there are scholarships available if you need one. Please do join us outside on the, um, on the sidewalk for refreshments after the service, and take home your chimes and, and read it. There's lots of good information in there. Walk in love as Christ loves us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For by water and the Holy Spirit, you have made us a new people in Jesus Christ our Lord to show forth your glory in all the world. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where with James and Paul and all your saints we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. 
Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
At this time, I'd like to invite anyone who may be celebrating a birthday or an anniversary to come forward to the altar rail for a blessing, or if you need special prayers for any reason, please come forward.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. And the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with each of you this day and remain with you forever. Amen.